All right, we are back. And in this segment, we'll talk about relationships with friends, and then we'll talk about relationships with parents. So first off, relationships with friends, I want to talk a little bit about the sex differences that have been observed between, I tried to make the male sign there on the left, and then the female sign over there on the right. Um, on average, we see that males tend to share activities with their friends. They tend to have friends who share their interests. Um, when they're with their friends, they talk about external matters a lot more than internal things, things that they're thinking about or worried about. Um, they don't tend to talk about their own failures. They definitely don't talk about their own emotional problems with their male friends. Um, they really demand a lot less of their friends, and so they have more friends. They have friends that are maybe um, specific to the different activities or different things that they do. Um, and so because the um, relationship is based on activity, you might need to have more friends in order to do the activity. For example, you know, you got to have a, enough to go play a pickup game of football or basketball or, um, you know, those kinds of things. And you may, need to have a wide enough variety that you can have friends who will go do this with you and then other friends who go, like to go do that with you. Um, so male friendships look a little bit different on average than female friendships. Women, on the other hand, tend to, with their friends, share more of their own secrets. They tend to reveal their weaknesses and their problems. They tend to, when they make those revelations, they expect their friends to show sympathy for them and, you know, relate to them. Their friendships tend to be more intimate than male friends, male-male friendships are, and they tend to be more emotional. And that doesn't mean they cry together. That means that they are willing to reveal that they're scared or that they are upset or that they feel like crying or um, like that. Women on average have fewer friends than men do, and, uh, but those friendships that they do have tend to be more intense. They tend to be more um, reliant on each other and expect more of each other than males do. So there is a sex difference that we see. Now it's not everybody, and so as I was describing these, you might be thinking to yourself, those don't describe my friendships at all. And, and so I'm not talking about every single person. We're just saying on average, these are the things that are more common in male friendships. These are the things that are more common in female friendships. But if you think about the men you know and the women you know, you might you might think realize that when men are talking to other men, they don't say things like, oh yeah, I tried out for that and I didn't make it, as often as you might hear a woman say something like that. Men are much more likely to talk about the things that they did win or the things that they did succeed at. Or, um, they don't say things like, oh, I don't know if I'd want to do that. I'd be, you know, scared. <laughs> like they wouldn't typically say that to another man. They might say it to a woman. And that's the thing. If we talk about cross-sex friendships where we've got men and women being friends with each other, men oftentimes can share the kinds of things with women that women normally share with women. And so men get a lot of times their emotional needs met through friendships or romantic relationships with women because that allows them to kind of expose the, those um, those weaknesses. Not always. Some men will share those weaknesses even with women, but they are more likely to share those with women than they are with other men. Um, all right. Our relationship with our parents. So... In the 18 to 25 year old period, one of the things that has made us realize that we need to have this emerging adulthood period is because for the average 18 to 25 year old, they have not really like left the house and become financially independent. They really haven't. I mean, uh, I was just watching something on TV and the person was saying, you know, when you're 18, you can move out, kind of they should move out kind of attitude. And the, the other person said, an 18 year old isn't an adult. They can't be moving out. And I was thinking, wow, that's a change because it 18 is objectively the legal age when you can move out. You can vote, you can do stuff. You're not allowed to drink, but you're allowed to do just about, you can enter into contracts. Um, you have achieved adult status when you turn 18 in the eyes of the law. But we have this period of time now where we continue to, to refer to 18 to 25 year olds as kids. They may be completely financially dependent where they still live at home or their parents are completely paying their bills. Um, I have a friend who is looking askance at me because my 18 to 22 year old son was living at home while her 18 to 22 year old was living in the dorms that she was paying for, that my friend was paying for. And she was kind of like, he still lives at home? Like, when's he ever going to grow up? And I'm like, well, I think my child is as financially dependent as your child is. <laughs> I don't, 
I guess uh, you're funding your child getting to run around and do some things that I'm like, you know, you can pay for that yourself, right? Um, people have different perspectives as parents about to what degree we are supposed to fund different parts of different things that our 18 to 25 year olds do because it's kind of this weird conflicting age of life. Are they dependent? Are they our kids? You know, or are they adults? <laughs> like, what, what is this stage? Um, but on average, 18 to 25 year olds in the US are financially dependent on their, on their parents still. When my kids were in this age bracket and living at home, uh, the big change in life was once they were done with high school and they were over, both my kids were 18 when they graduated. Um, so they're adults, now they've finished high school they made the transition from kid to roommate, in my opinion. I'm like, it's time for you to learn what it means to be a roommate. And um, I'm not going to nag you about your stuff, but you might get a financial charge of some sort if you don't conform, right? Like if you don't put the garbage out, the landlord finds you. <laughs> like um, you've moved into roommate status now. And uh, it's kind of a, di a difficult transition for both the parents and the child to not parent them anymore at the level that they had been. Like, it's not up to me whether you stay out past 10 anymore. But guess what? As a responsible adult, it's your responsibility to make sure that the other, that your roommates aren't thinking you died in a ditch. <laughs> so you're supposed to call them. You know, it's a different, it's a definitely a juggling act as the parent of an emerging adult. The emerging adult, um, what, because they're financially dependent, oftentimes will concede to things that their parents are suggesting that are not really in their best interest, but the child will go along because they don't want to rock the boat because they don't think that they can really take care of themselves yet, and so they'll go along. So it can be a tricky time for both sides. Um, this financial dependence definitely makes it murky, that's for sure. Even if the child is financially independent, even if the child has moved out on their own, you'll find that the relationship with parents tends to be really strong and that their lives are very much linked up during the emerging adulthood period. Um, one of the things that makes it tricky to um, find like a life romantic partner and settle down is that there's conflict between um, the demands of the romantic partner and the demands of the family of origin, right? You know, the parents are wanting certain things and they want to still have some say and, and the, the child is in love with somebody else and wants to start their life and there's like conflict and it can make it an extra layer of complexity. It's a, it's a lot more um, difficult when, you know, we aren't unlinked and don't just go, well, bye parents, <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. You know, we're tied together and we're finding in modern emerging adults that the kids are expressing much more connection to their parents than previous generations did. Um, there was a much bigger push you out of the nest mentality in the baby boomer generation and the Gen X generation than there has been for the millennial generation and Gen Z. Um, so that the parents are, for one thing, a lot less, they're a lot more authoritative on average, the parents who've raised millennials and Gen, X, Gen Zs. And so that makes them less, well, I'll just say annoying for the, for the emerging adult because you've got an adult parent who's been authoritative the whole time and helping their child to make good decisions and not necessarily buffering everything and helicopter parenting them and or um, snowplow parenting them where they you know are trying to keep all the obstacles out in front of the, out from in front of their child but instead of their they've been helping their child to grow and develop all along and so the child doesn't find their parenting that onerous and so they're kind of more willing to stay linked up and more willing to let their parents in um, because they feel a little bit more like supported friends rather than contentious children. I hovered over, should I say the word friend in the context of parents, because the goal of parenting should not be to be your kid's friends because you're not your kid's friends, you are their parent. Um, but the kid from their side, the 18 to 25 year old who's been authoritatively parented tends to look at their parents as people who respect me, people who like me, 
people who want the best for me and not as people who try to control me or, uh, you know, if their parents had been authoritarian or people who don't even care or won't make a decision and just make my life more stressful, like in kids who were permissively parented. So again, this kind of when authorita authoritative parenting really pay pays off it, when you're emerging adult is spreading their wings and leaving the nest and they really fundamentally like their parents, respect their parents and feel respected by their parents. Um, that's a, a really great place to be, right? To know that your parents actually value you as a person and not just as an extension of themselves. Um, so it's a tricky time, this emerging adulthood. And I'm stumbling over it because I've got, you know, a, I've got a full grown adult into adulthood child. And I've got one who just exited emerging adulthood and um, just moved out on his own, completely independent for the first time. And he's completely out of emerging adulthood as of last December. And it's like something honestly clicked in him that hadn't been there during this emerging adulthood period while he was sort of floundering around and trying to figure out. And suddenly something has flipped in him and he's like, I want to be my own man. And it's like, right on. Wow, you are following exactly <laughs> the developmental trajectory you're supposed to. Very shocking. My uh, my firstborn, she did, she's female and she was like three years ahead of her brother age-wise on this impulse. And I think that's really typical. So if you're female and you're listening to me right now, you might be going 25. That's kind of old. I don't know. I'd be off on my own, you know, by 20 or 22 or whatever. Much more common for females. For males, um, and even throughout history, males tended to stay home longer trying to establish themselves because they need to be more established on average than females do in order to attract a mate on average. I'm just, a lot of times people find this um, sort of characterization as, old fashioned, but it is what it is. On average, men want to be more stable when they enter into this intimacy stage. Females are less likely to have that kind of pressure. Um, they're, they are okay mates, even if they aren't completely financially independent on average. So although I just read that the number one thing that men look for in a dating uh, description in a potential female mate is um, ambitious. So maybe things are changing a little bit and men are looking for um, things that historically just women have been looking for. But we'll see. We, I'll, I will not speak to that until I see the data on it. All right, that should conclude officially and entirely emerging adulthood. So the next time we meet up, I will be talking about full-fledged adulthood. So I will see you then.